returns back to the first character that he created in his first Allegro. Now I want you to look at the piano score again, because here is the piano melody, and it's really, really important, because what he does is he juxtaposes the triplet duple uh, against each other again. But it's very interesting because he also he does it in a couple different ways. Uh, what I want to listen to you listen for, to first is the upper voice in the piano part. And listen to this melody. <laughs> some very similar things. It's not the exact melody, but he's got a nice little half-step motion in there, and he's also using some of the material that we've already pr uh, presented to the listener in the piano part. So this very nice lyrical melody is going underneath what you have on top. Now notice here, I think really what he's got going again is I think if you look as he goes through this allegro section, what he's done here is he's giving you a triplet figure, and I think you need to hear this in triplets. And so that you're hearing ba da 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 as you play through this allegro section. We're at measure 139. And so, and that's why he's got it accented here. He doesn't do this anyplace else. But I think what's happening is he's trying to accentuate this triplet feeling. And then these triplets that he's written out here are really going against that tr other triplet feel that's in the piano. So as you play this. <laughs> He's got accents written in here, but I don't really think that you need to overemphasize these accents in any way. But if you just naturally feel triplets all the way through here, I think it's going to work out and feel just the right way that you want. But just be careful not to overemphasize, and so it gets to have a syncopated kind of feeling as you go through here. And then after we finish this uh, return to the Allegro section, it, the last four measures really kind of calm down and put us back into a triplet feel along with the piano. But what does happen then at measure 151 is the piano takes over again and really represents the material that the saxophone has just performed, giving us that same triplet feel. At measure 155, we now move into the most technical part of this movement, and it is very, very difficult. And here's the, the strategy that you really need, remember need to take when you deal with something that is technically this difficult. Accuracy is more important than speed to begin with. You want to get this up to as fast as you can play it, but you can't do that if you actually can't play the notes. So when you start performing this passage at 159, make sure that you really are playing every note. Take it as slow as you possibly need to to get the exact comfort level in your fingers so that when you play through this, it will just flow off your fingertips as you speed it up. If you go too fast too soon, your fingers never develop an accuracy and comfort level, and it, they just are always going to make little mistakes and little flubs. So really, really be patient. And that's going to take, depending on your ability level, it's going to take as long as it, as it takes you. And that's just the way it is. Really strive to go as fast as you can. It's a very difficult section. But get it up to as fast as you can and really let it flow. Now, it's marked brilliant, and it's supposed to be pretty fast, and that's what you'll have to work on. Now, one thing I did realize here, and once again, this is from looking at the piano score, there's a forte mark in measure 160. This forte actually occurs at measure 159. And so really, uh, the, it's Mr. Tuttle's intent that this entire brilliant section be performed very, very fast and very, very loud and very, very obvious. So there's really no crescendo, per se, that occurs at measure 159. Now, I've performed this a, a few different ways. And one interpretation that I like, and you'll hear this as I play it, is that major 155, you see that he's got a decrescendo written down on this phrase. And it's kind of a neat effect. The piano is giving you a very strong downbeat. The saxophonist comes in with the melody on the end of one. And each time that you do this, he's got a little decrescendo for the first couple. Well, what I've done is because it just descends once again, and it just brings you down all the way until you get the brilliant section, I just kind of like to take this whole thing down and decrescendo all four of those majors so every entrance and every passage is slow. And then what I'll do is actually start the brilliant section a little on the softer side, and then I will allow that whole phrase to lead and push through all the way to a fortissimo when we get to major 164. Now, here then is this second allegro section of the first movement, uh, played almost up at tempo. I'm trying to shoot for right now about 66 to the dotted half note. <laughs>
section continues on for a little bit longer, and he gives you more of uh, the same melodic material, but with subtle variations. Finally, we get down to major 200, and we have a cadenza. Just before the cadenza, he returns to our, our very calm, lyrical melody uh, and brings that out. And I want to talk a little bit about the entrance into our cadenza so that we set it up. So let's go back to where this transition occurs, and this is going to be at major 193. This is where our lyrical melody goes into. Now what I want you to listen for is when we go into the cadenza, there's a couple things that happen. He has a crescendo written, but I also will take um, a longer period. I'll put a little retard on here, and I'll take more time on the A leading into the B flat on the fermata. Notice once again that this is that half step motion that he's used so often in this movement. Here's measure 193. Now notice here that he's also giving you a crescendo on those last two notes, where almost every time else I've suggested that you increase the tension and the volume on the A leading into it and then allow it to resolve going into the half step. But here it's a little bit different. Because we're going to go into this cadenza, allow it to grow, allow it to put the crescendo going from the A to the B flat, and really emphasize this and really move up into it. Now, the first thing you'll notice about the cadenza is that it's marked freely. And this is true with any cadenza. And really, cadenzas tend to evolve until they reach a climatic goal at some point. And it's our job to figure out how to make it progress through that musical lines and phrases to that goal as we go. Now, as I said, this is a very short cadenza, and you may think about elongating it. Now, I, there are students and people who like to do that, and I have had students do that. What you want to do is maybe take some of the existing melodic material and somehow come up with some figures that allow you to elongate this. And I think that's perfectly acceptable with cadenzas. And that's really traditionally and historically how cadenzas have, have worked. Now, as we play through this, I want to show you where the phrasings are. They're pretty clear and pretty obvious. We want to keep the metrical and the rhythmic values pretty much the same as what's written here and not change those around. But the phrasing is really, you can take breaks after the dotted half notes to begin with. And those are just tell us that he's really writing in those little breaks for us. And then from there, we're going to push through and keep the tempo going and moving the entire way. Now think of the first six beats of this cadenza as really being just that. Uh, just six beats normally written, make it very, very pretty, make it feel like it goes forward, and then we're going to take a small pause. Now the second statement of those six beats, we should start generating more excitement as we go through it. Take a listen how we do that. Notice how the second statement is not the same as the first. The first can be very genteel and calm, but then we're going to start moving this ahead as we go. Now, the, the rhythmic or the time values are going to be a little bit more condensed, so it's going to feel like it goes faster. Then, as we move into the triplets, we're going to continue pushing this all the way down to our low B flat. And now here, I really don't think that you should take a breath after this G, uh, because it, it impedes the progression of the line, and I think you want to keep it right on moving. Let's take a listen to how this transition will go from that second phrase into our triplet figure, and how we want to push this forward and get, make the, the motion feel like it wants to continue on as opposed to stopping. It's almost like you're hanging on a cliff and you're about ready to fall. And that G sharp, you want that climactic kind of motion, forward motion, hold it, let it hang there for a little while, and then boom, you go into the triplet. After the cadenza, we move back into our B melody. And our B melody is the same as the melody that we had previously back at measure 84. And this new section starts at measure 223. And you notice that the melodic content is exactly the same as the beginning, so really make sure that you incorporate the same vibrato characteristics. It's marked mezzo piano, espressivo. The difference with this melody than the first melody is that this melody is taking us to our climactic moment in the composition. And we really, really want to portray this and think where we're going with that. And that climactic moment occurs through this section and starts developing and building at measure 231, and then climaxes at measure 139 with a fortissimo in this section. Now this we want to continue on. Don't allow the intensity to fall as we go into uh, the next few measures. 
We want to allow it right where he has his decrescendo written, allow all of that intensity to back off in those three measures and really let it relax. And then we have a return of a, the faster tempo of our Allegro section to give us a coda to close this composition out. I think it's very interesting to notice that the climactic section is not all the fast notes, and it's not all of the very, very fast Allegro parts and all that energetic movement. Are really, it occurs in our just our opposite spot of where we would think about, which I think is a very, very interesting idea. But I think it really just has a lot to say about the emotional context that's being developed here. Here then is measure 223. <laughs> melody, but the melody is just a little bit different. Instead of tearing down in our duple pattern that he did at the very opening allegro, he takes it up more of in a scale fashion and then gives us just a little bit of variation on these triplet figures. And this motion goes through for a little while. You get one more fast flourish of triplet figures going into measure 230, about 252. And then at 255, he does something else that really is quite funny. And I've often seen people chuckle, get a smile on their face when they get to the end of this movement. Uh, just because it's just, you don't expect it. It's, in, it's really a lighthearted moment. After he's giving you all of this seriousness, he takes you back and just gives you something really light to kind of let the mood go. Uh, let's start at measure 255. Notice here that it has a diminuendo and a rollentando coming out of this very fast triplet figure. It gets softer and softer. And finally, in the last measure, he gives you this 16th note pattern, wherever that came from. And it just goes very, very slow down to our last tonic note, C. Also notice that he gives us a half step motion back. He gives it to us in two octaves. And really once again accentuate the first note here, back off on the second. But that's our main motive that continues throughout the whole composition. Here's measure 255. <laughs> C is really meant to be a super accented note. I think it just needs to be emphasized. And remember, accent doesn't always mean that it has to be super hard tongued accent. But uh, accents really just mean with emphasis. So as long as you really feel that push down to that tonic and push through those 16th notes to get there, I think it'll be fine. Here then is this closing coda section of movement one. <laughs> today and publisher David Gibson for providing a link of this tutorial on their publication Saxophone Today. If you're not familiar with Saxophone Today, I encourage you to look at their website and look at a sample issue of that magazine. It has many, many interesting articles on saxophonists who are working in the country today and gives you lots of hints and tips and interviews with those saxophonists and gives you more information than you could probably possibly ever want in one location. It's a great publication, and I encourage you to subscribe and take a look at that publication on a regular basis. I'm sure it's going to help your development out as a saxophonist. Thank you very much.